Hey, what's up there everyone? Yel is here, the founder of the IPS project and your host here on the show. The topic that we're gonna talk about um, in this interview is one that evokes a lot of questions, a lot of confusion, um, and it's quite a you know heavy topic in general. Yet, that does not mean that we shouldn't talk about it, right? We definitely should talk about it. Uh, it happens way more than it should, as I also uh, said, or will say in the interview, uh, but we'll say again here, because it's true, it happens way too much, uh, and it should not happen so much. So one way to, you know, slightly reduce those numbers and the suffering around suicide or these thoughts is by talking about it, by having an open dialogue about it, by learning more about it. And that's my intent here uh, with this interview. Now, I... Uh, you know, to talk about this topic, went out to search uh, for someone who worked at the crisis hotline. I was super interested to have someone with that experience here on the show. Through a lot of searching, I uh, stumbled upon Rebecca Hook, who has worked for more than uh, 14 years at Lifeline Australia as a crisis supporter. Uh, she's done, or she does, I mean, because she still works there, a lot more there. She has done over the years so many incredible things around mental health. So she has a lot of knowledge on this topic. She shared a lot of great insights and uh, brought, I think, a lot of uh, good understanding about suicide and how to help someone uh, who might be struggling with these thoughts. Because in general, the main aim of this interview is learning more about suicide, uh, but also how to be there for someone who might be having these thoughts, right? Uh, it's not so much focused on what if you have these thoughts and uh, how to cope with that. Not to say that there will not be something for you to learn in this interview if you might be struggling with that uh, as well. Uh, but I will say, or I will direct you more to the, the interview that I did with Mark Henning. Uh, some years ago, who is a mental health advocate, but also someone who dealt with these uh, thoughts for many years and who also attempted suicide. So uh, that's in that interview, we talk more about the part of uh, what if you have suicidal thoughts. So um, in the show notes, I will link up that interview. Uh, in addition with anything else that Rebecca mentioned in this interview, uh, and some extra resources around suicide. So the show notes can be found in the description of this episode, or you can also go directly to the ipsproject.com slash podcast and search for Rebecca to find the show notes. Now, I hope that you will gain something out of this episode, more knowledge, more insights around suicide and, and how to be there for someone. And again, if you struggle, I hope that you you might gain some hope uh, out of this interview. Rebecca, a warm welcome here to the podcast, uh, well, to the IPS podcast. It's a real pleasure to finally have you on the show and uh, to talk about a topic that I find very important, important that I think you find very important too, and uh, that I think we, yeah, the world could have more knowledge about. Yeah, so thank you for being here. Thank you very much for having me. This was quite a surprise, but I'm, I'm glad to be here. You know, suicide, because that's a topic that we're going to talk about, right? It's a heavy topic. Um, it happens more than it should. Uh, I sent it you a little bit about it too, but I have personal experience, actually. Uh, I've struggled with those thoughts and those feelings for a lot of years, but, you know, many years ago. Uh, so it's also quite a personal topic, actually, that I care about a lot. I thought before, you know, diving into um, some of the questions around suicide to maybe do a bit of uh, an introduction about who you are uh, for people to know why I have you on the show, uh, where you gained all this knowledge from and why I think you're a perfect person to talk about suicide. And this might sound a bit like a segue, but I think it might be fun before you do that to just explain what is the medal of the order of australia <laughs> <laughs> um the order of australia medal of which i've been a recipient 
is the cause of a lot of imposter syndrome that I feel, to be honest with you. <laughs> okay. Um, it's, it's an honour that's um, bestowed to some very lucky Australians, very few, um, and I, I have an Order of Australia medal. Um, Amazing. It's, it's from, I think I was one of the last batch to actually get it from the late Queen, so I feel a little bit special in that way. Wow. Honestly, it's, it's a bit of bling that I wear, which I feel very unworthy of, but which I'm constantly trying to feel like I've earned. So since receiving it, I've taken on more volunteer work, and I've tried to just up everything, basically. Um, you can receive them in multiple categories. Mine was received for um, services to, I think the category was community health. Yep. Um, but it was basically for just volunteering in a bunch of different areas. Mm. Um, most people, I'm, I'm a little bit unusual in mine in that I've received mine quite young in life. Um, generally, they tend to be given when someone's sort of retired or maybe, you know, half a foot in the grave kind of thing. So a lot of, I go to the conferences and a lot of the other people are, are sort of retirees and they, we're trying to encourage more young people receiving them. Mm -hmm. um, but at the moment I'm kind of flying the flag for the young people that have one and it's pure, it's purely luck. It's a really hard nomination process and I was just fortunate enough to have somebody that persevered through all the paperwork. So I, I, I found actually online uh, the article where you were mentioned, right? And you received this in 2000, uh, I think, 22, right? So two years ago. Yeah. yeah. What were some of the things, because you work at uh, Lifeline Australia, what were some of those things that you were talking about, like the volunteering things or the things that you do at Lifeline Australia that led up to receiving this award? I yeah, I think primarily I did receive it for the work I've done it with Lifeline. So I've been with Lifeline for I think about 15 years, maybe give or take a year, so maybe 14, 15 years. Um, so I've been on the phones and I'm still on the phones as both uh, as, as a volunteer. And then I also am a shift supervisor. I work um, in the digital space, so managing our online chats. Um, the team that does that. I also do centralised in shift support, which is supporting the crisis team all around Australia. Wow. I've been in a documentary. I've gone to Papua New Guinea and done the Kokoda trek. <laughs> um, I've done a bit of media things. I've done training. I've done mentoring. I, I obviously have an inability to say no. <laughs> so <laughs> I've done everything that I've been asked to do, basically, and I've, I've loved it all. I've grown from it all. Um, that would probably be the lifeline side of things. In terms of the rest of what led me to receive the Order of Australia, it would be um, I'm quite a prolific donor of, of blood and plasma. So I've given, I think, 174 donations to date of blood and plasma. Wow. Um, I had to take a pause briefly when I had my daughter. She's four now. And during that time, I kind of lost myself a little bit. So I discovered you can actually donate breast milk. So I ended up donating 13 litres of breast milk to save premature babies. I'm also a bone marrow registry and things like that. I've volunteered with um, homeless charities. Mm. I've invited homeless people to live in my house, three of which have accepted. Um, and I've done... I sort of put my hand up for anything that comes along. Um, so since receiving the Order of Australia Medal, I've also started volunteering with the SCS, which is a, a first response emergency service in Australia for, for floods yes. and, and rescues and things like that. Wow. Well, it sounds like it's well-deserved. You did a lot of amazing things. What got you interested actually to, you know, to become a part of Lifeline Australia and to do all these things like, what was the first, I don't know, start of the story for you, if there is something significant there? I'm not 100% sure. The best that I can work out would be in, in high school days and things, which is when people start generally having bigger life problems. Um, I had some friends that were struggling maybe with their mental health, with self-harm, with things like that. And I tended to be the person that they'd come to to speak about it with. And... And that was obviously a great honour because they trusted me and they were comfortable talking with me. But I felt horribly ill-equipped <laughs> and I didn't quite know what to do with it. So I sort of muddled through and I was always worried that if I put a foot wrong and something happened to them, the responsibility would somehow fall to me, which isn't mm. correct. But it was how I felt at the time. So that was always weighing on me, the fact that I tended to be the, the confidant of, of my friends. 
Um, and then I went on to university and I did study psychology and um, I had some friends that went on to do Lifeline because it helped their resumes and things like that. And I thought, oh, I'll give that a go too. That might help me. And I only really intended actually to join Lifeline to get me a, a, like a foot in the door um, mm. career-wise. But it actually ended up becoming a lot more than that because I pursued <laughs> after university a completely different career, but I kept going with the Lifeline volunteering. So I was working full-time and then I'd work nights at Lifeline, overnights and things. And then eventually... I was looking at my day life and my night life and they just weren't aligning. And so I thought, you know what, I'm just going to go all in and, and sort of do Lifeline and do work like that. And I haven't mm. looked back since. <laughs> yeah. Now, 14 years later, you still work there. Yeah. Yeah. So let's dive into, you know, some of the questions that I have about suicides. And I think maybe let's first start uh, with some just maybe general misunderstandings about it because there are quite a lot i think around suicides yeah. uh, and just some general insights around the topic mm -hmm. what is a misunderstanding about suicide that you hear all the time uh, or at least you know very often that you want to clear once and for all here i think the 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 big i'll go with two the big two that bother me are um, people saying that it's either it's a brave thing or it's a weak thing and it's not brave to take your life and it's not weak to take your life. It's, it's simply an act of desperation by somebody that feels that they have no hope left. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't like either of those ends of the spectrum. Um, that would be one. Um, yeah. The other big one would be it's just around language. I don't like it when, and it's just, a, it's a thing that we all do, but often people say commit suicide and that's sort of, it's a call back to back in the day when it used to be either considered a sin or it was against the law to take your life. And it's kind of, it's in the back of your head that it's, it's sort of judgmental language and it's not, it's not, that, that I don't feel that's appropriate to, to apply. Uh, to, to commit suicide? You don't feel like that's appropriate? I think the language carries with it a lot of weight that adds to the guilt and the shame of suicide, and that's not helpful for somebody that's struggling with those thoughts. It's true. Yeah. Yeah. Do you feel like there's actually any misunderstandings around people who work at the suicide line or at the crisis line? Uh, misunderstandings of what kind? Uh, I don't know, for the people who work there, um, or uh, any misunderstandings about the suicide line in general that people have or that you've heard people have. Um, when I tend to tell people what I do for work, um, they go, oh, that's, that's so hard. I could never do that. Mm -hmm. And it's mm -hmm. really, it's, it's not for everybody. That's very much true, mm -hmm. but it, they just think, oh my goodness, the weight, I could never possibly bear it. But it's actually really an honor to, to hear people share their pain with you and to be so raw and so open and so honest. And it's a privilege and I'm just so lucky to be in that position, I think. It's quite a unique position, actually. It's true. Yeah. And There's as far as like many... I see it, sorry, go on. No, go on. Mm -hmm. As I see it, sort of the, the people that ring are in pain often 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They don't get an escape from it. And if I can be on the phone with them for 20 minutes, half an hour, mm. an hour, whatever it ends up being, and give them some relief for that brief period of time, then that's fine. And it costs me very little compared to what it might gain them. And so I'm more than happy to, to do that because I can go back to my life, which is relatively, you know, a lot easier than perhaps what they're living with. And so it's not, it's not so hard as people might imagine. Yeah. Don't you find it hard though to end the call to not know, because uh, it's anonymous, right? To not know yeah. what will happen with them? Um, it can be difficult in some ways. Yeah, yes, you're right. All of our callers are anonymous and we very much protect their anonymity and also ours. Um, it's mm -hmm. kind of a, a safe place for both parties that way. And it makes it easier for people to open up if, you know, they never have to speak to me again. They don't have to see me in the street. Mm. A lot of the people that call us might actually have people that, that love them and that care for them in their life that they could open up to. But what holds them back is the fact that 
you know, I have to see you again tomorrow. And we've just had yeah. this really heavy conversation that's so daunting. So it's easier, often at least as a first step, to open up to a stranger. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, it's anonymous. I forgot the second part of your question. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh yeah, sure. Uh, you know, when when you're on the on the call with them and and you end the call and you don't know, like you know, how are they going to be? Isn't that a hard thing? You know, the not knowing parts of how they are. It can be, and it's something that we need to overcome. Um, sometimes we do know, like sometimes oh, yeah. we'll get somebody to to the point where they've gone, they've come up with their own plan that's going to keep them safe. They've decided who they're going to tell. They've decided what they're going to do. They've they've um, gotten rid of their means of ending their life, or whatever it might be. Or you know, they've said, yeah, okay, I do actually need some help. Can you get an ambulance here? That kind of thing. And we've heard them arrive. So sometimes we do actually get a pretty mm -hmm. clear outcome that they're safe. Sometimes we don't, um, but at the end of the day, we know that we've done the best that we can. And we also know, I think that ultimately it's not up to us. If somebody wants to take their life, they're going to do it anyway. Um, a lot of the people yep. that call us, there is at least a small part of them that wants to stay safe. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so that's what we've got to work with. Mm -hmm. And as I see it, and this is what I tell our students too, um, you really can't leave somebody in a worse position than when they call. So they're calling when they're pretty much at rock bottom and we can talk to them and we can hope that by talking to them, they end up feeling a little bit better or, you know, maybe they have some hope or they have some steps or they've got a bit of an idea of what to do next, or at least we've killed some time, if nothing else. It's, it's going to be very, very difficult for us to actually make them worse off by speaking to us. I don't, really see how that could possibly happen so just by calling we've either done nothing which is unlikely or we've at least made it a little bit better for them and yeah that's, that's a, right that's a win yeah yeah uh, so i um i did also like a volunteering uh, uh at the suicide line here in belgium uh mm -hmm. did not work as long <laughs> as you did at it uh but i do know also it's about you know the goal should be about um, giving them another day to go on, right? Mm -hmm. Knowing that you made their, their day at least a little bit better and that they might at least uh, be here another day longer. That's a bit of the goal and uh, the thing to focus on. Or that's at least Definitely. what I uh, have been told there. Yeah, because being in crisis, it tends to be temporary. At the, when you're in the thick of it, it can feel all-consuming and you can't possibly see beyond the blackness that you're feeling in the moment. Yeah. But these moments pass and all all we can do, or I think the most effective thing we can do is just be there with them and buy them mm -hmm. a little bit of time and a little bit yeah. of time. And maybe sometimes the safe plan that we come up with for somebody is ring us back in an hour. That's fine. Ring us mm -hmm. back in the morning. You know, go and get mm -hmm. some sleep. Go and have a shower. Go and have something to eat. Go for a walk. You know, ring us back. And, th and that time can often get them just little steps can get them yeah. through the really awful parts. Yeah, and knowing that they are at least not alone, and that there is someone out there that they can call to. Uh, yeah, I don't know what it's so like in Belgium. In in Australia, it's twenty four seven, so they've yeah, always same. got that. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah, it should be right. It should be. Mm -hmm. uh, now, of course, suicide it happens to you know everyone. I mean, it it happens to any ages, right? Uh, any skin mm -hmm. color. Uh, any background that you have, uh, have it can happen to anyone. Um, yeah, it doesn't but, discriminate. No, yeah. But of course, uh, there is always, it. you know, it does happen to some more than others, right? Mm -hmm. Could you maybe provide some insights into who calls the most to the suicide line? Um, which age, which gender, which ethnicity, who is at the highest at risk? I think the thing to remember is that no one is immune. So yeah. again, it can happen to anybody, but yeah, you're right. There are trends. Um, I think at the moment it's that about 75% of the, the people that will complete suicide in Australia, and that's not who feels suicidal. That's who, who actually ends their life. Um, are men. Um, in Australia, at least I don't know international statistics, I apologize, but it's the leading cause of death for people aged between 15 and 44, which is, yeah, I mean, it's, it's my cohort. It's, it's astronomical to, to think wow. that that is 
if you're going to die in that age group, it's most likely going to be suicide than anything else. Um, there's also a trend that's been happening where older people, um, suicide rates have actually spiked, at least in my country, in older groups, so 85 years plus, um, particularly men, it tends to be yeah a, a big killer lately. And I think that's driven by loneliness. Yeah, I just wanted to ask, yeah, can you see why it's increasing besides loneliness? Is there any other components of the increase of that? I don't have facts to back me up if I had to guess just by the mm -hmm. people that I've spoken to on the phones. I'd say loneliness would be a big thing. Um, quality of life declining would be a big thing. So although we're living yeah. longer, it's not necessarily a great quality of life. Um, isolation, financial pressures, that kind of thing I'd say would probably be big driving forces, but I'm not going to say yeah. that with confidence. <laughs> so for the people who are 85 plus, I can 100% see how loneliness is a reason why they might develop these thoughts, right? But for mm. the people who are 15 up to 44, mm. is it also mostly loneliness or what are the reasons why they mostly call to you? I think relationships tend to be a big core reason for everybody, whether it's feeling disconnected, feeling misunderstood, um, feeling like you're lacking closeness in your relationships. That's definitely a big thing. It's very different because who you are at 15 and who you are at 44 is a very different person. So they'll all have different challenges along the age span. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I'd say at the younger side, it could be just that lack of maybe life experience. You haven't gone through many hardships as such. Um, you might not realise the resilience that you do actually have within you. That can be something, just not realising, you know, you're 15, you're going through your first heartbreak. It feels like your world's ending. You can't see beyond that pain, that kind of thing. You know, we're all a bit older. We've had breakups and things happen. You know, it sucks, but you get through yeah. it. Um, I'd say getting towards the older age, it could be family breakdown. It could be financial pressures, you know, we've just come out of COVID, that's caused some problems. Um, it's going gonna, it's, it's gonna to be different for everyone and I don't really like to generalise too much. Sure. Mm -hmm. I will add though that um, there was a report in Australia that said one in three people are feeling lonely and that does definitely drive thoughts of suicide. And being lonely doesn't mean you don't have friends or family. It just means that you feel lonely. It means you don't feel comfortable opening up to them. It means yeah, you're holding back. And so you're, you're in your own inner world, even though you're surrounded by people. Yeah. Yeah. There's a difference between being alone and being lonely, right? Mm -hmm. Because you can be alone and not feel lonely, but you can be not alone and feel lonely. Yeah, precisely. Yeah. It, was there actually during Corona, I mean, it's past us now, right? But it still has maybe some effects on people for sure. But was there an increase in amounts of calls to the suicide line? I'm not so up to date with the statistics. Um, it's certainly, being on the phones, it certainly felt like, if not, it was, um, I feel there was an increase in calls. I believe there was. Um, but certainly a lot more callers, even if it wasn't their primary reason for calling, they were mentioning it. So whatever problems they already had, it was adding to them. Um, it was, it, I mean, it was a big thing. It took over everyone's life. It was all anyone was talking about yeah. for, you know, a good two years or so. And whatever you were going through, it just added to it and made it worse. Yeah, yeah. And it was driving the isolation and with that loneliness more, right? So, yeah, mm. it was not the best thing. Well, it made, it made so many things worse. It made domestic violence worse because, you know, you might be mm -hmm. stuck in, yep. in a house with your, your abuser. It made yep. substance use worse. It made financial pressures worse. It made, you know, the stresses of parenting worse. It's, just everything, <laughs> everything yeah. hard got worse. I think. Yeah, I think most to you know most people are quite happy that it's over now, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, uh -huh. is this is this? I mean, I do recall because it's been years ago that I did the training at the suicide line, but that, I mean, the most people who struggle or who take their own life are men, but most women do call to the suicide line the, the least people who call are men is that true 
Do you notice that from your own experience? Again, I'm I'm not very au fait with stats. I know how it feels. Um, yeah, sure. And that can be some shifts have have sort of themes almost. It's like, oh, I had all men tonight, or I had all you know breakups or all health issues. Um, from walking away from it, I'd say actually it feels like a relatively even split. I do know that that women find it a lot easier to reach out to help. That's just it tends to be pretty much a universal fact. Um, yeah. But I think in Australia, Lifeline is really, really well known. So men are as aware of it as women are, and it's pretty well known as a safe place to call, so anonymous. So anyone that needs to talk to somebody that feels like they can't speak to people in their life might be more willing to ring. So I think we talk to the men that wouldn't talk to anybody else, and we talk to the women that are probably talking to everybody else as well. So <laughs> we get a bit of both. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. Good. That's good to hear, actually, because I do feel like I recall something, but at least here in Belgium, that, yeah, that it was way more women calling than men. That may uh, well be true. Changed, and again, right? like I work mostly nights, and so that changes who I'm speaking to as well versus people uh, that work yeah, in yeah. the morning uh, or in the afternoon or on weekends. Like it's all it's all going to be sure. sharing different demographics. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. When I was actually, you know, dealing with his thoughts and his feelings, the hardest thing, you know, looking back now is to explain to people how these thoughts kind of slipped into my, my head, right? Mm -hmm. It's very hard for people who, who never had these feelings, never struggled with these thoughts um, to understand how someone could ever end up, you know, taking their own life. Mm -hmm. Very hard. Is there anything that you could share maybe of some insights uh, that you've learned from your training, how, you know, for people to understand who are listening, uh, how these thoughts could develop? And I could share my own thoughts mm. on this as well, right? But I'll, I'll let you go first. I think your insights would be very valuable. But I think going back to what I was saying before, no one's immune and all it takes is the right circumstance for anyone to be susceptible to those thoughts creeping in and taking potentially a really, really strong hold. Yep. Um, so I think, I mean, at Lifeline, it might be a little bit different than in Belgium, but at Lifeline, what we do is we speak to everybody. So we're speaking to people that are homeless. We're speaking to you know, very rich celebrities. We're speaking to people all around the country. We're speaking to people that are um, of every different ethnic background, every different walk of life, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So we get such a different uh, perspective on who rings. And really, I've heard from everybody. <laughs> so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in terms of what gets people to that point, though, I think it's just when you lose hope, when that when that dark curtain comes down and you can't see beyond it, and that's really, really tough. So, oh, I'm not, sorry, I lost my place. <laughs> I'm not sure what to no, say. No, it's okay, it's okay. Yeah, um, I mean, let's, let me add just my own thoughts a bit on this. On, because I still, I feel confused sometimes just thinking back about that time, right? Because mm -hmm. now I'm in a really good place. It's really hard for me to feel like, oh, yeah, I could just so easily develop these thoughts again. But it's really, like you said, the part where you just lose hope, where you don't see the end of the tunnel anymore. And often it is, or at least in my experience, uh, a combination of multiple ingredients that lead to the development of these thoughts, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And it's something that develops over a prolonged amount of time. It's not just you don't wake up the next day and say like, yeah, uh, I have suicidal thoughts now. It's something that slowly builds up more and more. Uh, and you don't notice it. Yeah. 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 Until you're like, oh, wow, maybe I should end my life. Maybe it's not, maybe the, the world's, maybe I don't belong here or maybe people are better off with, without me or the world without me. Right. So yeah, it's, you don't Can I jump on true. what you said there, if that's okay? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Because I hear, I hear that sentence so much and that's probably one of the other things that bothers me. So many people yeah. say, everyone would be better off without me. You know, I'm a problem. I'm a burden. My, you know, my partner, my children, my family, my friends, my boss, they'd all be better off without me. All I am is a problem. 
And that is so untrue. And I think what sticks with me is that I've spoken, you know, over 14-ish years, I've spoken to a lot of people that are suicidal and I hear that so often. But on the flip side, I've spoken to a lot of people that have lost somebody from suicide, that have been bereaved by suicide. And not a single person that I've spoken to on that side of the coin has ever said, gee, I'm glad mum killed herself or, you know, life's so much easier now that my daughter's dead. You know, nobody Mm -hmm. has ever said that. They were all left with questions and pain and wanting to know if they could have done anything, Mm. you know, and just a a lifetime of of just wondering and what ifs and looking back and, and, you know, constantly analysing. And then those thoughts entering their own minds, you know, if it was, if she couldn't cope, you know, how could I possibly? And that, that, you know, everyone's better off without me is something I really want to push back on. Yeah. Because it's such an easy thing to think, you know, somebody does a big sigh or they're like, oh, my God, you're too much today or whatever. You know, it's easy to to get into that mindset, but it's so untrue. You're right. It is untrue. And, you know, now being where I am today, I can totally see that it's very untrue. But when you're in that place, I don't know, it's hard to 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 say that it's that that's not true. Mm. Uh, yeah, it, it, feels, it feels real to you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I do like what you shared that no one is immune. And that's actually something that is really branded in my head too from my training. Uh, mm. Cause the teacher also told us that, that no one is immune. And they actually, it was also someone who was also at the training uh, uh, who shared a story, you know, that she heard uh, someone who was a volunteer at the suicide line actually committing suicide mm-hmm. himself. And, you know, the teacher responded on that, 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 yeah, no one is immune. You can have all the knowledge about it. <sighs> yeah, life still hits you sometimes so hard that you don't know how to handle it. So really no one is immune. Yeah. Um, yeah. This, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. I'm, <laughs> I'm, it sounds like it was a very heavy experience here that you went through. But also yeah, it's, I mean, it's a, uh, it's it Brandon. It's Brandon in my head, because <laughs> I was. I mean, everyone in the group was so surprised by that story. Mm. Uh, but it again highlights that we're all humans. Uh, no one is immune, and life is. Yeah, life controls so many things that is that are so hard to deal with. Yeah. When you are on a call with someone, you know, and uh, you end the call. How is it actually for you, you know, after 14 years talking with people who have these thoughts and these feelings, what kind of thoughts and feelings does this evoke in you? I think it's a, if you're doing it well and you're handling it well, it's a knife edge kind of balance between, in order to be effective, you need to connect with the caller and that means giving a bit of yourself to them, at least during the call. And so, you know, heavy calls will will impact you, but you also need to be functioning to take the next call, to to go off after your shift and and live the rest of your life. So you have to keep a bit of yourself outside of it and have like a little protective bubble. Um, So it does impact you. You know, we're really lucky, at least where I work. Um, We have great debriefing. We have great supervisors. I'm actually a supervisor, so I have to say that. but we have great supervisors to, to debrief with and to speak with after the call, fantastic supports. Um, we're encouraged to, you know, take breaks, do a lot of self-care at the end of every shift. You know, we, we do a big talk about what we're going to do to look after ourselves and keep a buffer between the work and the rest of the our life. Um, but occasionally there will be a call that will stay with you and it might stay with you yeah. because it was a little too close to home or it was a topic that you're mm. particularly sensitive about Mm -hmm. Or, you know, you were just in a more fragile place that day and it just kind of got through the chinks in your armour. For whatever reason, there will be some calls that will stay with you and that's not necessarily a bad thing as long as Mm. you cultivate self-awareness around it and it's not having a detrimental impact on you. I think if we took the calls that we took all day, every day and, and nothing got through to us, that would be a pretty clear sign that we were burnt out and that we shouldn't be taking yeah. calls. So yeah. it's it's that very fine balance. Yeah. A bit like what you said in the beginning that, you know, when you tell people what you do, that most are like, oh, I could never do that. Um, yeah, it's the ability to, to once you end the call and you're home, 
to let go a bit of those things, right? Yeah, yeah. I yeah. Usually we try to keep a buffer between work and home. So it used to be that you know it could be commuting or going for a walk or listening to a song or driving in the car or you know going out for a coffee or whatever. Just just some little space. Hey, sorry to interrupt the interview here with Rebecca and me. Uh, if you you know if you want to learn more about mental health, about relationships, about the mind, body and brain, then I could recommend you to have at least a look at the courses that we offer at the IPS Academy, because the courses there are made with guests that I've had here on the show. And there are many more courses in the making. So there are quite some yeah, more exciting courses on the horizon that I can't wait to release in the near future. My intent is to make them, uh, well, of course, insightful and practical that you could actually do something with once you learned, uh, once you took the course, but also to make them uh, fun and entertaining. I work with each course with an animator to make lots of animations in them, lots of illustrations. Yeah, it's also fun and engaging to actually take these courses. So besides them being very practical, they are also fun and engaging to watch. So check the IPS Academy. Um, I will put in the description a link to the Academy, uh, but you can also go directly to the ipsproject.com slash academy to find uh, the courses that we offer so far. They're all made with guests that I've had here on the show. So if you want to learn more, uh, yeah, in-depth things from them, spend quality one-on-one time with them virtually, then the courses are a great great thing to check out. All right, let's return back now to the interview with Rebecca. Let's learn a bit more about, you know, suicides and how to help someone who has these thoughts, Mm -hmm. Uh, or if you assume that they have these thoughts. What I feel what you learn at the suicide line are, I mean, personally, I think life skills that Mm -hmm. I feel everyone should have it's a bit like first aid right (laughs) i I personally feel like everyone should learn first aid yeah yeah exactly right yet that doesn't exist there's no first no emotional first aid class like you have for first aid which is kind of kind of ridiculous if you think about it where i work we actually run courses it's called the accidental counselor and it's for people who find themselves in the role of counsellor who aren't counsellors. Uh, so it's like teachers or it's hairdressers or it's oh, yeah. train drivers, people like that who end up talking to these people in huge amounts of distress but are like, I'm not a mental health professional, what am I doing? And it's kind of like a crash course and I think that's sort of really useful and something like that to be taught to everybody would just be so valuable. That's amazing. Mm. Okay, I don't know if we actually have that in Belgium, <laughs> but it's a, it's a good thing. It's like you know you can do it for a few hours or like a half day or something like that, and it just gives you like it makes you feel a little bit less like oh what do I do? Someone's you know in a crisis and has reached out to me. Yeah, truly, that's amazing. And I mean, even if it does exist in Belgium, it's not so well promoted then compared to first aid. So mm. uh, I feel like yeah, these things should be equally promoted. Because yeah. these wounds both got very deep, right? Physical wounds and emotional wounds mm-hmm. uh, got both very, very deep. And I imagine in your life, a lot of the people that know you, I know a little bit about your story. A lot of the people <laughs> that know you would probably, your story might have prompted them to go out and like renew their CPR certificate mm-hmm. or their, you know, their first aid kind of thing. You like, oh right, my right. goodness, what if I'm with him and something happens? You know, I, I might need to do something. But by the flip side, you know, somebody that's had, history of say depression or self-harm or something like that i don't know if people then go out and be like oh how do i have a conversation around someone that's struggling yeah maybe yeah you're talking about my cardiac arrest right yes (laughs) yes. Uh, yeah 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 you're you're actually right i mean my girlfriend uh learned how to drive a car because of it because she didn't have a license yet so Uh yeah and and a friend also had cpr training because of what happened to me but i Mm. i guess you're right maybe with yeah, if you know someone. But when you depressed. were feeling suicidal, did people yeah. go out and learn how to talk to somebody yeah. in a mental health crisis? Way less, way less. I'm sure there's some, but way less. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But maybe that's not because they don't want to, but just because they don't know where to do that or where to yeah. learn that. You know. Yeah, that's a good point. There's a there's a maybe. big gap there. Yeah. 
Um, when you are at the, at the line, you know, someone calls to you, how does such a conversation start? They've called us, so it starts how they're ready to start it. And we're very patient. And some people might ring and they might just cry for the first few minutes. And that's okay. Like, we'll, we'll check, you know, are you safe? Um, that kind of thing. And then we'll just say, okay, you, you take your time. You know, we're, we're here when you're ready. Or it could be that they're, they need to get a lot of anger out of the start. Or they might just need to blurt their entire story out and we don't get a word in for 20 minutes or whatever it might be. Mm. Or it could be that they say hi and then nothing really happens and it's kind of blood from a stone and we can see they're hurting but they're not quite ready yet to open up. We need to build their trust and build that connection first. So really how it starts is entirely dependent upon them because it's whatever they're ready for. Yeah, they've reached out. But the very first thing, would, and this is on the phones, this is in day-to-day life, would just be listening. Listening is far more important than anything you say. And what if, you know, they started talking a bit? How... You know, how do you start talking about the actual suicidal thoughts that they have? How do you assess how deep these thoughts might go? Um, you know, le- aimed maybe at someone listening right now who wants mm-hmm. to learn uh, how to do this in life as well, right? Not at the line, right? But just in real life. Um, yeah, how do you how do you start to talk about suicide with someone if you assume that they might have these thoughts? Uh, mm-hmm. And how do you assess how far it goes? I think being straightforward is important. So not sort of beating around the bush. Like we don't want to saying things like, you're not going to do anything stupid, are you? Is ambiguous and it's unhelpful and it shuts down a conversation. So (laughs) trying to avoid that. Worst way to start. (laughs) Also though, I think even if you completely botch what you say, as long as you say it with with kindness and with trying to help, the, the actual words themselves don't have to be perfect. There's no perfect magic formula. Um, The big tips I'd say would be making it safe for them to speak. So not shutting down, not acting in shock, you know, inside you might be panicking a little bit, but right now you are their rock. So Mm. be their rock. Um, I think what else? Um, Letting them know that you care, that you're there for them, um, that you're a safe person to talk to especially if this is, you know, their first time reaching out, it's really, really hard. So you don't, yeah. you know, you're their first experience maybe of asking for help. And that first experience they have will then determine how easy it is for them to go on and ask for help in other places mm-hmm. later on. So it's quite important that you're just open and accepting and you're like, okay, you're struggling. If you're worried about someone um for suicide or for their safety, I think just being really straightforward and really frank is important. So you can you can tell them mm-hmm. what you're noticing, like, hey, mm-hmm. you know, you haven't been at our weekly dinner, you know, for the last couple of months or, you know, you're not going to, to mum's group or I haven't seen you at netball, you know, and whatever it might be that you're noticing that's got you concerns, just mention it. Just say like, hey, is everything okay? Um, and if you continue to be worried, just say, you can ask, are you are you feeling suicidal? Are you having thoughts about wanting to die? And if you ask it unambiguously and really clearly, you'll generally get a straightforward answer. People mm-hmm. will be honest with you because you've been brave enough to ask. Mm-hmm. And then you know what you're dealing with. And they'll say, oh, no, 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 no. Like things are really hard, but it's not that bad. You know, I'm just going through a funk, blah, 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 blah. And you're like, okay, cool, no worries. Or they might say, yeah, I am. And then you go, okay, cool, let's deal with it. But you know which camp you're in when you ask and you don't know otherwise. Yeah. Yeah, this is something that I, you know, also learned and I think everyone there was also being trained, was surprised by, or at least here in Belgium, that's the case, right? That you, when someone is at the line, that you drop the words actually as soon as you can in a way. That you drop the word suicide because then we all can talk about it. The word is set. It's out yeah. now, right? It takes, it, it's not taboo. Once you've said it, it's, yeah. it's on the table. You can talk about it. Yeah, yeah. So I do guess that if you want to talk with someone, uh, not at the line, but just in life, yeah, just saying the word, saying if they have these thoughts, if they think about it, is, uh, 
yeah, that's the, that's the best way to start with the conversation, right? And to really know what they're thinking and feeling. Yeah. yeah. And if let's say that, you know, they are thinking about it, do you have any more, you know, I don't know, uh, tips to know how deep these thoughts might go? You know, any questions that you could ask to kind of get a mm -hmm. better idea what's playing in their head? Yeah. A lot of these might be like situational or context cues, but mm -hmm. just generally I'd say you want to, let's say they are suicidal and they've been honest about it and say, okay, you know, that's what you're dealing with. Um, it'd be good to assess their safety, you know, have let, let's say it's a phone conversation with a friend you're not face to face with them and they're obviously visibly upset and they've said yes they are suicidal you you want to find out have they done anything already to hurt themselves to endanger their life um or if they have a plan to um mm. so mm -hmm. okay you're having thoughts you know you, there's a part of you that's feeling like it wants to die do you have an intention to follow through on that do you have a plan where are you at again that's just drilling down on exactly how much risk you're you're dealing with in the moment and working it out yeah. so you can figure out where to go from there it's like a choose your adventure <laughs> i guess yeah and uh the the part that you said about trust and feeling safe which you know are uh key right mm -hmm. how do you do that actually when you talk to a stranger who has no idea who you are how do you build that trust and make them feel safe that maybe listeners could also uh you know have a stake ways uh, to use in their life mm -hmm. is there anything that you see what you do on such moments to create that i think um avoiding anything that might make them feel shame because these feelings are there for them these feelings are very painful the last thing they need is to to add to their pain by feeling ashamed of them or or like they can't talk about them so just being accepting of where they're at and not saying, why would you want to kill yourself? You've got an amazing job. You've mm. got this holiday. You've got this fantastic house, da, 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 da. That's not helpful. Then they go like, okay, I guess you're right. Yeah, all good. And they won't talk to you again. And then they might not talk to somebody else again because I think that's what, that's what people are going to think of me if I tell them. Yeah, so, you're inflicting guilt on them, mm, right? Yeah. So anything that avoids imparting shame or judgment upon them, so mm -hmm. really just letting them know you care, letting them know that you're there. Just even the words, I'm here for you. What do you need? What What's going to be helpful for you right now? Or, you know, take your time. Tell me. Just talk to me. Or, you know, we'll figure this out. Just something. You know, letting them know that they're not in this alone, that they've got support, and that, that they don't have to be feeling so isolated anymore. And this is something they can talk about and they can reach out to help, uh, reach out for, mm -hmm. help with. Are there any other don'ts that you think about right now? You know, like the not inflicting guilt is a big one, right? Yeah. Uh, but any other really clear don'ts that you could share? Um, or maybe do's if, uh, if any of them come up? Um, I think... Again, going back to the don'ts, I don't want to impart too many don'ts because it's it's hard when you're thrust into this position to have a thousand yeah. different things going through your mind. You know, I must do this, I mustn't do this. Da, 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 da. As long as you do it with kindness, it'll be received okay. So I think, you know, we can completely put our foot in the mouth and, and bumble the words. But as long as we're doing our best and we're showing that we care and we're showing that we're there for somebody, it doesn't matter too much whether you get the words wrong. Mm -hmm. um, so just, you know, through your body language, through the kindness in your voice, you know, you could say something really unfortunate or the wrong thing to say completely, but as long as you're doing it in a nice way, it's not going to, it's not going to do any real harm. Um, avoiding anything that makes them feel guilty or shame again. Uh, I think minimizing, I yeah, you minimizing don't is also a big one, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's not that bad. Oh, you're just having a rough yeah. day. Oh, you know, what would you do that? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Because yeah. that, again, it shuts somebody down and they're not going to open up if, if they're shut down. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, just listening with the intent to understand, I think, even if you don't, you don't have to agree, uh, I mm -hmm. guess, with what people say, right? But at least trying mm -hmm. to understand why they're saying this. Yeah. Uh, that's showing love in the end, right? Uh, yeah. 
and there's resentment. And it's making them feel less alone. And that's people that are struggling with suicide often feel that they're so alone in that struggle. And just just sharing it with somebody and sharing it with somebody that's accepting of them and their feelings can yep. just be such a relief. You know, it's nothing in their whole situation that's made them, that's led them to the point of suicide could have changed. But just having shared that can make it a lot easier to deal with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's say that you are, you know, on a call with someone. Um because not every conversation on the suicide line or in real life when you sit down and ask how someone is uh, will go as you planned in your head, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, someone might become very angry, start shouting at you, uh, have a panic attack, start crying. A, a lot of things can happen. How do you handle difficult um conversations like that or challenging conversations like that how do you handle those moments uh, is there anything that you do i think just being being patient and not taking things personally so if someone's angry they're allowed to be angry as long as they're not directing you know abuse to me personally mm -hmm. they can rant and rave and that's fine that's them getting it out um if somebody you know just wants to cry if somebody is shutting down I think just recognizing that that's them and their pain and I just need to to sit here and wait for them to be ready, um, that helps. How do you stay calm actually when someone is being extremely angry and just shouting words uh, to you? How do you not take that personal? And maybe that's how you stay calm by not taking it personal, but is there anything else that you do? That's a little bit of a gray zone. so. Okay. On the on the line, like I have a pretty thick skin, so you can you mm. can rant and rave and say everything under the sun to me, and it's not really going to phase me. Um, whereas other people that might be taking calls might be very sensitive, and they might not be able to to handle hearing foul language, and that's their boundary, and that's just a personal boundary. And so we tend to encourage people to to hold their personal boundaries, and also, you know, we're a service here. We're primarily volunteers. We're not here. To be abused so we'll we'll give people warnings like hey you're going to need to rein that language in so i can keep supporting you um mm. and just just letting them know look i can see you're angry that's okay can you just not use those words and then we can talk about all the things that are that are making you angry um Setting letting boundaries them know, giving them a way. couple of warnings yeah exactly mm -hmm. um but again just not taking it personally like people express their pain in so many different ways and I'm just there sort of being a witness to it, offering whatever might be useful to them. When, you know, the conversation kind of comes to an end at the suicide line, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you're kind of running, running it up. How, what is something maybe that you could give to someone listening when they are in a conversation with someone um, to end that conversation and to know that they might be safe or to know that they might, you know, um, yeah, not slip deeper into these thoughts. Is there anything that you do at a suicide line to ensure their safety uh, mm -hmm. that you could share with uh, anyone listening? If someone's been um, disclosed that they're at some risk, like they're, they're struggling with some thoughts of suicide or they've had a plan and we've been able to disable it for the call or whatever it might be, um, Ideally, before the call ends, we want to have a backup for when those thoughts return because in all likelihood, they're probably going to return. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Somebody is struggling with pain that's been building and building and building in their life for usually, you know, a long period of time. One phone call is very unlikely to fix it. You know, sometimes we yeah. get lucky, but yeah. usually, you know, it'll bring them some relief. It'll buy them some time. But those thoughts are in all likelihood going to return. So we want to have a plan. Okay, so when this, when you're next in this spot, what can you do? Or to prevent yourself getting to this spot, what can you do? And that's, we like to put the responsibility ideally on the caller um, that's seeking the help to come up with that because it's going to be a lot more meaningful if they say, yeah, okay, here's what I could do or here's someone I could reach out to rather than us saying, do this, do this, do this. You know, it's, we're not an expert in their life. They are. 
um, we can work with them and we can suggest some things if they're completely at a loss for ideas we'll come up with you know we'll be like you know what about your your GP what about your mum what about you whoever it might be um, but we try to encourage them to come up with a safe plan to either prevent them getting to this point again or to figure out what to do when they're at this point so that they're not in danger and sometimes that might be um, well like in Australia we have we have apps on phones that are, like there's a safety planning app for people that have recurrent suicidal thoughts or that struggle with self-harm or whatever it might be um, there's yeah. apps for there's apps for everything I'm sure you're aware um, yeah. but it could also just be having like a list of people that you call or just recognizing you know what when I'm overwhelmed I find it really helpful to watch YouTube or to listen mm -hmm. to some music or to go for a walk or to eat a tub of ice cream you know whatever it might be that's that's something that makes me feel better in the moment and then and then once I've finished doing that activity I check in with myself and you know what I'm feeling a bit better so okay or it could just be calling back and that's fine people can call mm -hmm. back as much as they need to and we would much much rather going back to our service I guess sorry lifeline we our service is suicide prevention and crisis support so primarily I guess we're suicide prevention but a big part of that which people tend to miss is the crisis support and I would and I think most people that work on the line would agree with this I would much rather the people ring us when they're in crisis before it gets to the point of suicide um, because if we can you know there's no need to go through that extra pain if you can nip it in the bud in the early stages fantastic there's no there's no medal for going through more suffering than you need to so yeah yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, you're right. Mm -hmm. What if actually someone, you know, doesn't want to accept help, or doesn't want to, you know, refuses uh, support? How do you deal with that actually, or what do you do? I would say we're unlikely to speak to that person because the people that have picked up the phone and reached out there's at least a very, very small fraction of them that does want help. And that's the part that we're appealing to. That's the part that we're working with. Even if most of them is like, nothing's going to work. I've tried everything. It's hopeless. I'm really determined. I'm going to go through with it. At the end of the day, they did pick up the phone. And so that's, we're, we're working with that. Mm. Yeah. Or, or maybe if they're uncomfortable uh, to accept help out, outside of the suicide line, what would you say to someone who might be having these thoughts uh, and who just is really uncomfortable or, or not sure to reach out to someone close by them. Mm. Yeah, I think a lot of times people do feel uncomfortable reaching out, which is why our service is quite good in that it's easier to reach out over the phone or over text message or over, um, you know, online chat because they can disconnect it. They never have to talk to us again. They never have to see us again. So that's kind of where their first impression often for reaching out for help. And that's why we kind of determine whether they then go on and feel comfortable to try other people. If they're not comfortable reaching out to other people, you'd want to explore, I suppose, why? What's what's stopping them? What makes it so hard? Is there something that would make it easier? Maybe sitting down with you, your spouse or your lecturer or whatever and having that conversation is really really daunting and you don't think you can do it okay, mm -hmm. write them a letter you know they can read it in their own time you don't have to see their reactions um just trying to break down the barriers of why it would be hard and what might make it more manageable for them yeah yeah i i i remember because i had these these thoughts when i was in high school um that and this is quite common, I guess, too, uh, that I thought I was the only one uh, who, who was feeling this way. Hmm. Um, and that no one would understand me if I would share it to them. Hmm. And I do also remember that I tried like a desperate attempt <laughs> to, to share it with a teacher that I was not doing okay or not yeah. feeling okay. Um, but I feel like, yeah. How was it received, if I can ask? Um, yeah, I, a bit neutral, I think. I think uh, she cared, I guess. Uh, but I, th I know that she didn't actually really pick up on that and talk more about or dive more deeper into my feelings and thoughts. Uh, but that she, that at some point, just, I don't know, some days or weeks later, 
uh, they picked me out of the class, some person, uh, mm -hmm. which if I look back now was a quite a red flag because of course uh, everyone asked me afterwards why I was taken out of the class and I was super uncomfortable <laughs> to share anything about this, right? Um, and I was just taken by some guy to a room who asked me, yeah, if I wanted to share anything, which, you know, it was a strange room, didn't know it, didn't feel safe, mm. didn't feel safe with that person. So of course I just said like, yeah, I'm okay. <laughs> it's, it's, I, I, I don't know. I'm not really. It wasn't handled very it. sensitively by the sounds of it. Yeah, no. And I'm sure all of them cared and all of them wanted to do the best, you know, but this is what are maybe things that frustrate you, you know, that that school do, that schools do, or or that parents do, or or anything else in society that could have been handled differently to make talking about suicide easier and better to do. I think that's a really big question, and I'm not actually. I had a really powerful experience just a few days ago. We um where I work at Lifeline, we have a support group, an in-person support group for people that have survived suicide attempts. So they're people that have like actively tried to take their life and have come out the other side and they meet. And, and we had a professional development actually with I think six of them that came in and told us about their experiences. And they all had such very different experiences, like different things that, that led them to help, different things that they'd received from people in their own life, you know, varying levels of support different experiences in the hospital system, whatever else. But they, they all spoke mm. about that. And I think just hearing that diversity was so powerful and their honesty was so powerful. So I think lived experience, hearing about it helps. Mm. Like you sharing your story there so candidly and so honestly, there'll be so many listeners that you'll have that will relate to that. And they'll be like, oh, I thought I was the only one, just like how you thought you were the only one. So hearing... Yeah other people's stories I think is such a powerful thing and it's not you know me sitting here anecdotally saying things it's actually someone that's been through it on the other side said no I was here this is what happened I think that's really powerful that's probably the most powerful thing so people just being honest about their experiences and sharing it and that gives hope as well yeah it's true right yeah that those people ended up surviving and doing good in life and feeling yeah. okay is there anything that you think school, schools could do differently or better around mental health, maybe, in general? Uh, but, of course, around suicide, too. And I don't know how it is in Australia, right? But, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I, f I feel like we've got so much more focus on mental health these days compared to, you know, even 10, 20 years ago. Definitely, yeah. But I do feel we haven't actually seen necessarily an improvement in mental health as a result of that. Yeah. And that's a little bit perplexing in some ways. Mm -hmm. So I think we've got more visibility than ever, mm -hmm. but we haven't dealt with, I guess, the, the preventative steps. So building resilience and coping skills. You know, we know how to recognize when someone's in really poor mental health and, and struggling mm. with their mental health but we don't know how to prevent them getting to that point. And I think there's a lot of focus now on the visibility on mental health when it's deteriorated, but not about preventing it. So I'd say earlier intervention and, and a focus on, on how to create good mental health rather than how to deal with bad mental health is equally important, if not more. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, focusing more on how to build resilience and how that looks like. Because, um, you know, Trauma, for example, is a word that's been thrown everywhere. These Everyone days. has trauma. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly, right? Yeah. So, it's it's, it's everyone, lost all meaning sometimes, I feel, but yeah. No, you're it's, right. I mean, no one, the, you know. Yeah, not to, you know, to say for someone listening, if they have gone through something yeah. horrible, that it might definitely not have been very traumatic, but not... That's a, I that's mean, a point I'll, I'll jump on too, because I've got this from the phones. What is a crisis to one person is not a crisis to everybody. True. And we're not here to judge the level of somebody's crisis. So someone, you know, can go through the most horrific situation I could possibly imagine in the world and they're dealing with it 
quite well. They're dealing with it better than I'm dealing with forgetting my shopping list at the gro grocery store or whatever it might be. Like they're just handling it like a trooper versus, you know, somebody else that's dealing with this, what I would consider a minor inconvenience and they're ready to take their life over it. And we're not here to judge either end of the spectrum because everyone's an individual. Everyone has different levels of coping and what's yeah. a crisis to one person isn't going to be a crisis to everybody. And that's, that's, is what it is. And I think going back to that too, a lot of people that are in very, very dire need of support feel either they don't reach out or they're mm -hmm. very, very reluctant and guilty about reaching out because they think, oh, I shouldn't be asking for help because so many people have it worse off than me. You know, so many people have it harder and I don't That's want to use true. the resources. And we get a lot of callers that ring up and it tends to be yeah. the callers that need support the most. And they say, look, 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 I won't take much of your time and I'm, I'm sure you've got more important people to speak to. And it's just that, and then they'll tell us the most heartbreaking story. And I think I'd like to get the message out there that you don't have to wait until you're the person in the world that is suffering the most before you feel like you're worthy for asking for support. There's no reason to go through that. You know, let's let's get help to you while you're suffering because you're just as worthy and, you know, maybe we can prevent some extra suffering and that's a good thing. Yes, yes, you're so right. Yeah. Um, these are quite destructive thoughts actually to have. And yeah. I guess and it's really in a way... It's... Mm -hmm. I guess in a way it's good to have perspective, right? To be like, oh, well, I could have it worse, but I also think there is a, uh, a negative side to, to doing that. Or some people certainly always try to say like, oh, yeah. other people could have it worse, but you're not being there for yourself when you do that. Yeah, it's, 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 it's your perspective. So you could look at somebody in a much worse situation and see them as an inspiration, like, you know, I'm having a really tough time right now, but look at this person. They've gone through such yeah. hardships and they're absolutely killing it in life. And, you know, wow, I'm going to look up to them and be like, if they can do it, I can do it. And that's a really positive way of seeing it. Or you could be like, oh, you know, they have it so much harder, so I can't ask for help. So I just have to suffer here alone and, and not share my burdens and get worse and worse and worse progressively. So it's whether it helps you or hinders you, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, let me ask first. How much time you still have? Because <laughs> I'm not going to keep you here. In the middle of the night here. here. <laughs> My four-year-old doesn't wake up for five hours. Oh, so I forgot to ask in the beginning how what time it was there. But yes, it's dark. I see it now. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, well, I'm not going to keep you here the whole night. Uh, but I just have a yeah, few more fine. questions. Mm -hmm. I um, did, I mean, some years ago, an interview here uh, with Mark Henning, who is, uh, is quite a known person uh, advocating for mental health. And uh, he used to struggle uh, with suicidal thoughts. He actually attempted suicide at some point. Um, and I made from that interview a, a couple of small clips and placed it on YouTube. And they received a lot of comments. And I just want to read a couple of comments to you. Sure. Uh, to just hear your thoughts on, you know, how you would respond to them if there would be someone calling to you. Mm -hmm. um, so there are two comments that are, I guess around the, the, the same team. Um, and I would say they're self-hate and self-blame. And I think maybe in the beginning, we talked a bit about this already, but uh, let me just read them. So this is from uh, one comment from someone. If I only had the courage, if I only wasn't a coward. Uh, and this is another comment, a bit more extensive, a bit longer. Nobody cares. Nobody's interested. It's all my fault. They always want, want to tell me how bad I am, that I'm a failure. They only want to play me. I am always a bad person and I'm tired of being the bad one. I'm not bad. I promise. It's just that I'm nobody. I'm a failure. I hate it here. I hate it, hate it. Uh, I know the world would be uh, okay without me. If you would have someone like this calling to you, how would you just, I don't know, what would you say to that person? I'd start by listening. So trying to understand why that's their perspective in the first place, because I can jump in and say, no, 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 that's not true. You know, mm -hmm. everyone loves you. You're worthy. Da, 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 da. That's not mm -hmm. going to be particularly helpful and they're not going to hear it and they're mm -hmm. certainly not going to take it in. So they're I think not going to believe just, that. Yeah. Just approaching with curiosity about, wow, that's really dark. You know, it seems like you've been, rejected by you know you feel like you've been rejected by a lot of people in in your life what's what's caused you to feel that way um, 
and just hearing them, I think, is a good opening point. And then taking it from there, yeah. I have two more comments. Also, just going to read them out um, uh, to you and let's see what you will say to them or just your thoughts or opinion on, uh, about them. Everyone loves you once you're gone. Another comment. If people try to get help before, they call them attention seekers. If an attempt fails, they call them self-harmers. When they succeed, they say, why didn't they reach out? Um, I do also personally know from my own experience that when I was having these thoughts, uh, a bit the story that I shared, that I felt like no one cared uh, about about my thoughts and feelings. And I, I mean, looking back now, I think because they didn't know that I was actually having these <laughs> thoughts, right? So mm. not because they didn't care probably, but just they didn't know. But that is, I think, quite a common uh, feeling that people have with these thoughts. Yeah, the uh, is there anything, yeah, uh, that you want to share? Uh, any thoughts that came in when you heard those comments from from those two people? I think you're you're right with what you said there. That is, they're really common viewpoints, and that's why at the very very start, what I said was, it's it's not brave, it's not cowardly, it's it's just an act of desperation from someone that's lost hope, and people do say those things, and I think. It's not necessarily that it's what they actually believe. It's just kind of a shorthand of expressing something that's really, really complex, those feelings. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes we get lazy with our communication and we say things and then we don't realize how it's being perceived by other people. And that's the message that they're taking away from what we've said. And that's yeah. not a good message. Mm -hmm. How could you actually give hope back to these people though? Is it by just being there and letting them know that you are there for them? Or is there something more? Or is it something that's kind of up to them? I'm not there to give anyone hope. Like their reason for living isn't going to be me at the end of the phone. I'm there to, to bear witness and to maybe hold their hand for part of the journey, but I'm not going to be what saves somebody's life. It mm. Ultimately, it's, it's their choice. Mm. Um, what gives people hope is going to be different for everybody. I think... I find responsibility of some kind can can help people. So whether it's, you know, I'm mm -hmm. feeling really suicidal, but oh, my boss is relying on me and I've got to be at work on Monday, so oh, I'm going to have to pull for the route. Or, you know, I really want to die, but who's going to feed the dog? Or, mm. you know, what would mm. my kids do? They'd be, you know, left with their grandparents and they're useless or whatever it might be. Um mm responsibility helps even if it's you know I have this particular faith and that would look down upon suicide so I couldn't possibly bring shame like that's it's still it works it keeps somebody safe it's not the best reason so yeah. responsibility mm -hmm. helps um obviously the, the better version of that would be having some meaning to your life and I yes, think yes you know mm -hmm. we're going back to Victor Frankl kind of thing that yeah. you know mm -hmm. no matter mm -hmm. what you're suffering through if you can see some kind of purpose or or some reason for it that drives you, then you can bear any kind of situation. Yeah. Um, I guess responsibility could be a first thing to go for. And then the next level would be to aim for meaning. Yeah. Yeah. Meaning would be, you know, meaning is great. Yeah. Yeah. You can go mm -hmm. through the most tremendous pain if you have, if you have a reason behind it. Um, yeah. Not that you want to go through pain, you know, <laughs> suffering isn't the goal, but, but suffering's But it will happen. happen. Yeah. I mean, exactly. you know, life will throw random things at you or just yeah. you know, events uh, that will cause suffering. So, yeah. And nobody's life is going to turn out the way that they plan it because we all have big dreams for our, for our career, for our family, for our, our, you know, leisure activities, our accomplishments. And in our dreams, we never factor in all of the hurdles and the obstacles and things that will happen, but they'll happen and we have to have a way of dealing with them. Yeah. The book that you mentioned, uh, Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Franklin, uh, is there any other, you know, resources just that you think of that could be uh, like, like any other books, uh, for example, or anything else uh, for someone who would want to help someone who might be having these thoughts or also for someone who might be listening who has these thoughts? Mm-hmm. Um... I'm, I might not be the best person to ask. I, I kind of hate self-help books. 
Um, they really <laughs> get under my skin and I can't stand them. They, uh-huh. they promote this aggression in can, me. That can I, I ask why? Like. I'm just curious. I find them really – I probably haven't read the right ones and that's what people will tell me, but I find them mm-hmm. really um, patronising in some okay. ways. They're just mm-hmm. they're, they simplify things too much, and it's like, well, that's just not realistic. Um, I do love Man's Search for Many, though. I find that one a really meaty one. So I think I just haven't received the right books. But I love reading, so anything that's an escape, is good. anything that helps you is good. I know, like a lot of a lot of us on the on the phones or at, at the helpline, we avoid the news, and that's a lot of people are going to say, oh, you need to know what's going on in the world around you, and you know you can't, you know put your head in the sand and da 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 and I agree with that but you find out the important things anyway and I think just having some kind of filter where you're not exposing yourself to the negativity 24 7 you're not Uh missing much apart from Mm -hmm. just being constantly dragged down so you know choosing what you expose yourself to um, I think a little bit of protection you're so right on that I think if people would cut away the news and news is also on social media, right? You also get a lot of mm. news uh, feed yeah. on there. So I think also cutting that away uh, t- intentionally, uh, oh, that that could, yeah, could be really great for a lot of people, I think. If you're seeing the world as a very, very dark place, just, you know, in yourself, yeah. and then you switch mm. on the news and, you know, there's a war here, there's a murder here, there's violence here, there's unrest here, there's, you know. Yep everything going on you're like wow it is terrible mm. <laughs> you know it doesn't it, confirms, it doesn't really help yeah, yeah it confirms what you already bias. believe right but yeah. the thing is and maybe this is also good for people to know that that is just a selected amount of truth that is not yeah. the whole truth right maybe just a really small percentage of the truth which is right right i mean uh, most things in the world go right it's not wrong it's just uh yeah, selected. there's a lot of good truth. in the world yeah and i get we get to hear that too which is lovely yeah. Um, for people, you know, listening who might just, you know, uh, want to help someone or, or get better at that or learn more about that, is there any resource that you would have for them? I would say you can Google, like, if you if you want to know how to have the conversation, like have difficult conversations, there's so many free resources just to, to Google sort of tips and strategies and things like that. Um, I'd also encourage people perhaps to to just do a check in with themselves to know if they're ready for that because they might get really mm-hmm. inspired and decide to go out there and you know sometimes you can take on too much and it's not helpful if someone's going through a dark time you want to throw them a life preserver you don't want to get in the water and drown with them because that doesn't help them and it just means you know, you're in a dark place as well. So I think having that self-awareness is good. Um, looking after yourself so that you can then look after the people around you. Useful. Yeah. So to check in with yourself if you might actually be yeah. ready to take all that info in. Yeah. And in terms of like, if you want to go out and do something nice, just go be kind. Just go be kind to somebody or be generous in your assumptions of other people. Someone cuts you off in traffic. They're not a jerk, you know. Maybe they're racing their sick child to hospital, you know. That may or may not be true. Maybe they are a jerk, but why would we presume? <laughs> why would we presume the worst? Because it just, I think, just go out and be kind to people, be generous in your assumptions. Yeah, it's changing the story in your head a little bit, like with the traffic thing. I think having the story first, like, oh, maybe they're in an emergency. It could be a better story to have first than, oh, they're a jerk. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We will. Everyone has struggles. Everyone's had bad days. And on our worst days, we wish that the people around us would extend us some some kindness and give us a little bit more leniency or whatever. So let's just presume that somebody around us that's being difficult, maybe they're having the worst day of their life. And so don't make it worse for them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It doesn't hurt you. Just be nice. How do you actually see, you know, uh, as a last question, uh, the future of Lifeline? Uh, or or of the crisis hotline, how do you see the future of that evolving? Is there anything that you're aware of uh, that they're doing that will be excited for the future or or something that you would love to see maybe in the future? Um, it's just in the years that I've been there it's it's grown so much like astronomically, so I can't now we've got 
digital services, people are reaching out to us on, on text and online, and they're people that would never pick up the phone, like younger generation people. Um, they'd never pick up the phone, but they'll happily pick up their mobile and, you know, type a message. Yeah, so yeah. that's changed. Um, I think we get, oh, we get, I think it's more calls than any other helpline in Australia sort of combined, all of them combined, which is just crazy. Um, we get, I don't know, I think it's a call like every 28 seconds or something. Um, wow. Yeah, it's a lot. That it's is a lot. A lot. But we have... We have like 10,000 volunteers, so, you know, there's a lot of people. Wow. That's not that's not all on the phone. Some are in stores and doing different things. But um, yeah. how it's going to grow, I think there's going to be – it's probably going to be more online. Maybe eventually there'll be a video component. I could see that happening. Um, there could be more work from home, more – I think just just growing, more support, more calls answered more quickly more more of everything yeah okay um yeah. we've already got a lot of visibility which i think is is great so anytime there's anything distressing in the news or in an article in the newspaper or whatever the lifeline number is always flashed up um we've got great brand awareness and, and recognition which is fantastic that's true yeah that's good yeah um maybe as a last question you know um is there any last thing that you still would like to share uh for someone listening who would want to help someone or for someone listening who is struggling with his thoughts or just anything more? I think I was probably remiss earlier by not mentioning uh, if you're reaching out, sorry, if, if you have a friend that's reaching out to you for support and, you know, I said, tell them that you're there, tell them that you're listening, you know, make it safe for them to talk to. I think another really important thing on that is know your limitations. Um, so you can't be their only support and you can't be there 24-7 for them because mm. that's that's unsafe for them um, because you're not going to be there all the time. You've got other things going on in your own life and it's, it's only going to do harm to you. So part of being there for them will be helping them find a network of other people to reach out to so that it's not all on you because you, like I said before, you don't want to drown alongside them. That's not helpful. You want to throw them a life raft, yeah. give them some help. Yeah. Yeah, the, the safety plan that you mentioned, um, it's quite a concrete card. Uh, it, it, like, it, it has certain steps, doesn't it? And isn't one the of way them... We, we, the way we do it on the phone, yeah. um, we go through certain steps, yeah. Mm -hmm. And isn't one step to also add, like, three contact uh, persons that you could reach out to? Oh, Yes, yeah. I mean, identifying your support network, whoever that might be, or yeah. coming up with a support network. Who do you think would be helpful? Who do you want to talk to? Let's go find those people. Yeah, yeah. So I guess it is good for people, like you said, uh, uh, to have more people in their uh, environment yeah. to add to I that think list. It, it can be common sometimes, you know, you see a friend that's struggling, you get the courage to say, hey, how are you going? They're suicidal. You say, okay, I'm here for you. And then suddenly you're inundated with their needs all of the time and, you know, you can't handle that. <laughs> it's too much. And it's, you know, they need they need mental health, like a professional of some kind as well. So you can't be the, everything to everybody, sometimes knowing your limitations and making sure that, that the love is shared. <laughs> it would be helpful. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Rebecca, uh, I could throw endless amount of more questions at you, <laughs> but thank you uh, already now for you know taking the time for answering questions, for giving great answers, and also I mean for being the person who you are. I mean truly, I have so much respect for people like you. So uh, you more than deserve that medal from uh, the Order of <laughs> Australia. <laughs> uh, I would give you another one. <laughs> so thanks oh again for being here. Thank, thank you so much. It was lovely speaking with you and you're doing a wonderful service too and having amazing conversations and entertaining me on my walks. So I appreciate it, which is my self-care. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thanks. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Uh, one, one more thing. There's a, a final end question <laughs> uh, that I ask all my guests uh, that I would love to ask you too. Uh, but before I do that, um, is there any, I don't know, websites or any place that you would love to point people to? Maybe Lifeline Australia or just, I don't know, 
uh, or any place that people could get in contact with you or or something is there mm-hmm. yeah, any websites um I'm not a, I know a lot of your other guests are sort of, um, they're gurus and they run workshops and things like that. I'm not, I'm just me doing my thing. So I have nothing personally <laughs> well, to promote. Still doing amazing things. Um, yeah. Thank you. Mm-hmm. So I'm not very interesting online. Um, but I think the, the Lifeline website, even though, you know, we're an Australian organization, we support Australians, it, it still has good information for anyone around the yeah, world totally. that speaks English, I guess. So you'd need to speak English to read the website. But it's um it's lifeline.org.au. There's a lot of different toolkits and resources and things like that to read, whether you're struggling yourself with various issues. It doesn't have to necessarily be suicide. It could be anything. Or whether you're trying to support somebody else. It can just be a good starting point. Or, you know, find your country's specific um, leading organization and, and, you know, use that as a starting point and reach out. Yeah. So, uh, for people listening, I will add that, uh, in the show notes, uh, as I agree, it's a great place just for resources and to learn more about the topic. Um, the final end question that I have for you, uh, and you know, uh, it doesn't have to do per se something with suicidal me- mental health. It's just, you know, uh, you can answer to it whatever you want and you make it a, you can make it as short or as long as you want uh, <laughs> ignore my dog at the back yeah. <laughs> walking away from this all right <laughs> so <clears throat> from everything that you've seen experienced lived and learned in your life what is the one thing that you know to be true i think that you can handle a lot more than you think you can um if you've got the right reasons and you've got the right people around you that would be a big takeaway and that everyone has struggles because when you're in your own struggle sorry this is going to be two things when you're in your own struggles you Mm -hmm. think everyone else has got it easier you know no one else could be possibly suffering like this so just realizing that a lot of other people are also in pain and try not to add to their pain try to make it better if you can try not to add to your own pain a lot of the times when we're going through struggles we can't necessarily fix them you know you've someone you love has died or something dreadful has happened um and you know that can't be undone you can't fix that but what you can do is perhaps try not to make it worse so if you neglect basic things like you know you're not eating well you're not getting out in the sun each day you're not getting exercise you're not sleeping not doing those things is going to make it so much harder doing them isn't going to remove the pain but it makes it better to cope with so i think Try not to make other people's problems worse. Try not to make your own harder. Try and go out and be kind. You're right. It helps. Yeah. <laughs> Keep it simple. Rebecca, thank you truly once again so much uh, for being here. Thank you. It was lovely speaking with you, Yellis. All right. That concludes this episode with Rebecca Hook. I really hope that you learned more about suicide, that you... If you want to be there for someone, uh, learn more ways uh, on how to approach such a conversation. And if you struggle, I mean, the primary focus of the conversation of this interview was on how to be there for someone and more insights on the topic of suicide. Not so much about uh, what to do if you struggle with these thoughts, but still, if you would str- if you struggle with these thoughts, I do hope that you still gain something out of this interview with Rebecca and from things that she shared, you know, or things that I shared, uh, some parts of my story that I shared. It can be different and it is super hard to believe that. Uh, I honestly would not believe that myself if, um, I don't know, 14 year or 15 year old Yelis would be listening to this interview. But it can be different. Uh, There will be actions required from your part, of course, to make that difference. And one of them is uh, reaching out to people, to uh, a crisis support line like Lifeline Australia or any other ones. Every country has one, uh, or I would assume almost every country has one. In the show notes, I will put any resources that Rebecca mentioned. I will also add a couple more myself that I think could be really helpful if you want to learn more about the topic and how to be there for someone, or if you struggle with these thoughts. Thank you really, uh, you know, for being here and for spending some time with Rebecca and me and for learning more about this truly, truly important topic. 
we all should learn more about this topic. Don't underestimate the importance of truly uh, just listening to someone with the intent to understand and the power behind that, because that can be the start of healing wounds and suffering in the world and in someone's life. Thank you again for being here. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast and to leave a rating. Uh, that would mean so much to me on whichever uh, podcast app that you use to listen to this. Uh, almost all of them you can leave a rating uh, or uh, if you want also a review. It would greatly help me to find more incredible guests like Rebecca. That's it for this episode. I uh, hope you know that I might have the chance to welcome you again on another episode. Until then, this is Elis Fass, signing off. Bye. Before you take off, if you already feel like you've gained many lessons and insights from this episode and you want to continue your journey of personal growth, be sure to take a look at the IPS Academy where we offer in-depth quality and fun online courses from experts that have appeared here on the podcast. Learn from a two-time world record holder how to master goal setting and confidence. Learn from a certified stress educator how to manage your stress and live a more balanced life. Learn from a therapist how to heal past wounds and learn from a neuroscientist to master your mindset. These are but some of the course topics you can find at the IPS Academy. Each course we offer is made with fun animations and stunning illustrations. There are also a few lessons to try for free so you can get a taste of what the course is like. We have countless reviews from other students so you can see what others think and last but not not least, there is a 30-day money-back guarantee if you end up not liking the course. If any of this sounds interesting to you, you can check out our courses by going to dipsproject.com slash academy or by clicking on the link in the description of this episode.